Hey everyone, and welcome back. Today we're gonna to be diving into a topic that I think is absolutely fascinating. Yeah. Mars colonization. Definitely. Um, you know, I think everybody at some point looks up at the night sky and wonders, you know, could we actually live on Mars? Right. And to help us unpack this, we've got some really fascinating source material. Yeah. We're going to be looking at some snippets from uh, Elon Musk's interview with Lex Fridman. Okay. And also we've got a really interesting YouTube video that kind of breaks down all of the technical challenges. Right. Of actually making this a reality. Yeah, and I think what's particularly interesting is that this isn't just some, you know, pie-in-the-sky science fiction fantasy anymore. Like, right. we're at a point where the technology is actually starting to catch up yeah. with our ambitions, I think. Yeah, so let's start with Elon Musk. Okay. I mean, you can't really talk about Mars colonization without talking about Elon Musk. He's the poster child. He's the poster child, right. But, you know, what? what exactly is driving his vision? Why is he so obsessed with Mars? Well, if we dig a little deeper, you see that Musk's enthusiasm for Mars is really um, tied to his sort of pro-human philosophy, right. this idea that humanity's progress and survival are paramount. Right. And he sees becoming a multi-planetary species as a crucial step in that journey. Right. And he's talked about this idea of a window of opportunity, you mm -hmm. know, that we have the technology now, but we might not always have it. Exactly. So it's almost like, let's, you know, strike while the iron's hot. Exactly. But it's not just about escaping a doomed Earth, you know. Right. He... Musk emphasizes that protecting our home planet remains a top priority. Okay. He sees Mars as an opportunity to expand our horizons, you know, oh, and push boy. the boundaries of human potential. So it's less about abandoning Earth and more about ensuring humanity's future. Exactly. Wherever that may be. Yeah. Okay, so we want to go to Mars, but how? Right. And that YouTube video we have. Uh, really kind of paints a, a pretty daunting picture of the challenges involved. Oh, absolutely. It compares the scale of this undertaking to building Rome, launching Apollo 11, no. deploying the International Space Station, and settling North America. Oh, my God. All at once on another planet. Wait, seriously? Yeah. That sounds almost impossible. How on Earth, or rather off Earth, are we supposed to pull that off? That's where SpaceX's Starship comes in. Okay. Um, it's designed to be a game changer. This is a super powerful, reusable rocket right. capable of carrying massive payloads to Mars right. over and over again. Yeah, I've heard they're aiming for a fleet of like a thousand starships. A thousand. That's just mind boggling. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. But even with that kind of firepower, there's still limitations, right? You hit the nail on the head. The current Starship design relies on chemical propulsion, right? which, while powerful, is not the most efficient for long-duration space travel. Okay. It just wouldn't be sustainable for a large-scale Mars colony. So Starship alone isn't enough. Right. What's the missing piece of the puzzle? This is where NASA enters the picture. Okay. Think of them as the seasoned veterans of space travel bringing decades of expertise. Right. To the table. Right. They've been researching something called nuclear thermal propulsion. Okay which could significantly boost Starship speed and efficiency. Nuclear propulsion. That sounds pretty intense. It definitely comes with its own set of challenges and risks. Sure. But the potential payoff is huge. Okay. We're talking about shrinking the travel time to Mars from eight months to just 45 days. Wow. Now that would change everything. Suddenly Mars seems a whole lot closer. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And beyond just propulsion, NASA brings crucial experience in planning and executing these long duration missions. Right. Figuring out the logistics of living off world. Right. You know, things like food production, waste yeah. management, you name it. So it sounds like this is a team effort SpaceX provides that bold vision and innovation. Right. While NASA brings the wisdom and experience like a perfect partnership. I like that. But I'm curious, is everyone on board with this Mars first approach? That's a great question, and it leads us to some alternative perspectives that I think are worth exploring. Some argue that focusing on the moon first makes more sense, using it as a stepping stone to Mars. What's the reasoning behind that? I mean, the moon seems like a completely different ball game compared to Mars. Well, the moon has water ice, which could potentially be used to produce rocket propellant. Okay. Imagine refueling spacecraft on the moon, right. making the journey to Mars much more efficient and cost-effective. So it's like building a cosmic gas station on the moon. Pretty much. Yeah. yeah. It's an intriguing idea. Yeah. But there are counter arguments to consider okay. that lunar ice might be more valuable for lunar development itself. 
Okay. Making it easier and cheaper to access and utilize the moon's resources. So we've got these two competing ideas, moon first or Mars direct. Right. Which path is the best way forward? That's the million dollar question. It's a debate that continues to spark lively discussion within the space community and to get a clearer picture. I think we need to delve deeper into the pros and cons of each approach. What's fascinating here is that the Moon versus Mars debate, it's not a simple either or scenario. Both destinations have their own, you know, unique advantages and challenges. It's like comparing apples and oranges. Right. They're both fruit. Right. But they offer different flavors and nutritional values. Exactly. So let's break it down. What are the key arguments for focusing on the moon first? Well, proponents of the lunar approach often highlight the proximity factor. Oh. The moon is just a few days journey from Earth, right. making it a much easier target for testing new technologies, establishing a permanent presence. So it's kind of like a practice run before we tackle the much longer and more complex journey to Mars. Exactly, and because of that shorter distance, Missions to the moon would be less risky, more cost effective, right. allowing for more frequent launches, a faster pace of development. That makes sense. Yeah. You could iterate and learn from your mistakes much quicker on the moon than you could on Mars, right? where every mission is a much bigger gamble. Absolutely. But what about the argument that lunar ice could be used as a propellant source? How feasible is that? It's an idea that's been gaining traction, particularly as we discover more about the abundance of water ice on the moon. Right. The concept is to extract the water ice, split it into hydrogen and oxygen, okay. and use those elements as fuel for spacecraft. So we're talking about setting up like a lunar fueling station. Yeah. That sounds pretty futuristic, but wouldn't it be incredibly complex and expensive to set up such an operation on the moon? It would certainly be a major undertaking requiring significant investments in infrastructure and technology. Sure. However, advocates argue that the long-term benefits outweigh the initial costs. I can see that if you could refuel spacecraft on the moon, it would drastically reduce the amount of fuel you need to launch from Earth. Exactly. Potentially making interplanetary travel much more affordable and sustainable. Precisely. It could open up new possibilities for exploration, Dang. even commercial ventures in space. Right. But as we mentioned earlier, not everyone agrees that lunar ice is the best way to fuel our Martian ambitions. Right. There's the counter argument that that lunar ice might be more valuable for developing the moon itself. Exactly. Uh, can you elaborate on that perspective? Absolutely. This viewpoint emphasizes the potential of the moon as a unique and a valuable destination in its own right. Okay. Not just a stepping stone to Mars. So it's about recognizing the moon's inherent value and potential. Exactly. Rather than just seeing it as a means to an end. Exactly. Proponents of this view argue that lunar resources, including water ice, right. should be primarily used to support a thriving lunar economy and infrastructure. That's an interesting point. By focusing on lunar development, we could potentially create new industries, generate economic growth, right. even establish permanent settlements on the moon. Precisely. And those advancements could, in turn, pave the way for more ambitious missions to Mars and beyond. Right. It's like building a solid foundation before constructing a skyscraper. I like that analogy. It's not about abandoning Mars, but rather about strategically using lunar resources. Right. To create a more sustainable and robust spacefaring infrastructure. Exactly. But let's shift gears for a moment and hear from those who are firmly in the Mars direct camp. Okay. What are their key arguments for prioritizing Mars over the moon? Well, proponents of the Mars Direct approach often cite the scientific and exploratory potential of Mars as their primary motivation. Okay. Mars is a planet with a rich geological history, a diverse range of environments, right. and the tantalizing possibility of past or present life. So it's about unlocking the secrets of Mars and potentially answering some of humanity's biggest questions about the universe and our place in it. Exactly. And beyond the scientific allure, Mars also offers the potential for long-term human settlement. Oh, really? While the moon is a harsh and unforgiving environment, Mars has more resources that right. could potentially be utilized to support a thriving colony. We've talked about water ice, but what other resources are we talking about? What makes Mars a potentially more habitable destination in the long run? Well, Mars has an abundance of carbon dioxide in its atmosphere, okay. which could be used to create breathable air and even manufacture rocket propellant. Wait, so we could potentially make our own fuel on Mars. Exactly. That would be a game changer. No more relying on those costly and complex launches from Earth. Exactly. 
that self-sufficiency is a key argument for Mars colonization. Right. And in addition to carbon dioxide, Mars also has vast deposits of minerals and metals mm -hmm. that oh. could be used for construction, manufacturing, and even potentially terraforming the planet. Terraforming now, that's a whole other level of ambition. But is that even remotely feasible with our current technology? We're talking about transforming an entire planet. It's certainly a long-term goal, and the technology is still in its early stages. Sure. However, there are scientists and engineers who believe that terraforming Mars is theoretically possible. Wow. Albeit a monumental undertaking that would likely take centuries to achieve. That's a mind-boggling concept. Yeah. But even if we never fully terraform Mars, the process itself could lead to incredible breakthroughs in science and technology. Absolutely. It's like pushing the boundaries of human ingenuity to the absolute limit. Absolutely. And even without terraforming Mars, could still be a viable destination for human settlement. Okay. Albeit one that would require us to adapt to its unique environment and challenges. So it's about embracing the challenge of living off-world, pushing the boundaries of human adaptability, learning to thrive in a completely alien environment. That's a pretty bold vision. It is, isn't it? And this vision has been championed by some truly remarkable individuals like Dr. Robert Zubrin, okay. a leading advocate for Mars colonization. I've heard of him. He's the author of The Case for Mars, right? Yes, he is. What's his take on the whole Mars colonization debate? Zubrin is a passionate advocate for a Mars direct approach, okay. which emphasizes efficiency, affordability, and the use of local resources. Okay. He believes in getting boots on the ground as soon as possible, right. starting with a small self-sufficient outpost and gradually expanding from there. So it's a more pragmatic approach, focusing on the essentials, building up a Martian presence gradually rather than trying to do everything at once. Exactly. Zubrin argues that this approach would be more cost-effective and less risky than grand visions of terraforming right. or building massive Martian cities from the get-go. I can see the logic in that it's about taking a measured approach, learning from our mistakes, mm -hmm. gradually building up our capabilities on Mars. Yeah. But how does his vision differ from, say, Elon Musk's approach? Okay which seems much more ambitious and technologically driven. That's a great question. While both Zubrin and Musk share the same ultimate goal right. of establishing a permanent human presence on Mars, their approaches differ in terms of scale, technology, and timeline. So it's like different paths leading to the same destination. Precisely. Musk's vision is grander, involving massive starship fleets, advanced technologies like nuclear fusion, right. and the eventual goal of terraforming Mars to make it more Earth-like. It's a vision that captures the imagination and inspires a sense of awe. But Zubrin's approach seems more grounded in reality focusing on near-term solutions right. and a more gradual path to Martian settlement. Exactly. Zubrin believes that we can achieve a sustainable human presence on Mars with existing or near-term technologies. Okay. Using local resources to minimize our reliance on Earth. It's like comparing a high-tech futuristic skyscraper to a humble, self-sufficient log cabin. Right both serving as shelters, but with vastly different approaches. Yeah, that's a great analogy. But regardless of which path we choose, there's no denying that colonizing Mars would be a monumental undertaking, both technologically and socially. Absolutely. It would require a level of international cooperation and human ingenuity that we've never seen before. And beyond the practical challenges, there are also profound ethical and philosophical questions to consider. Yeah. What does it mean to expand humanity beyond Earth? What are our responsibilities to future generations of Martians? These are questions that go far beyond the realm of science and technology. You're absolutely right. The quest to colonize Mars is not just a technological endeavor, but also a philosophical and ethical journey that forces us to confront our values, our beliefs, and our vision for the future of humanity. Yeah, it's incredible to think that, you know, something that was once pure science fiction is now a topic of serious discussion and debate. Right. And it's not just about rockets and robots. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, forcing us to grapple with some really big questions. Yeah. About humanity's future. What's fascinating to me is that even if we never actually set foot on Mars, right. the very act of striving towards this goal yeah. can push the boundaries of human knowledge and innovation. Right. Imagine the technologies, the problem-solving strategies, the sheer ingenuity that would emerge from this endeavor. Yeah, I totally agree. The potential ripple effects across countless fields is mind-boggling. It is. But I have to admit, after this deep dive, I'm feeling a bit overwhelmed by the sheer scale of it all. Right. Like, it's exciting, sure. but also a bit daunting. I understand that feeling. It's easy to get lost in the technical details and the grand visions. Yeah. 
But at its core, this quest to colonize Mars is about something fundamentally human. Right. Our innate curiosity, our drive to explore the unknown. Right. Our relentless pursuit of pushing the limits of what's possible. Yeah, it's like this primal urge to venture beyond the horizon. Exactly. Discover what lies beyond the familiar. And in this case, the horizon is literally millions of miles away. Millions of miles away, exactly. And it's not just about satisfying our curiosity. Right. Colonizing Mars could also be a crucial step in ensuring the long-term survival of our species. Right. That's the, you know, the backup plan argument. Right. Safeguarding humanity's future in case something catastrophic happens to Earth. Exactly. It's like diversifying our portfolio, so to speak, not putting all our eggs in one basket. Right, right. Mm. But even if we manage to establish a self-sustaining colony on Mars, wouldn't it be incredibly challenging to maintain a connection with Earth? Sure. I mean, we're talking about vast distances and communication delays. That's a valid concern. And it raises some interesting questions about the future of human culture and identity. Right. Would Martian colonists eventually develop their own unique culture distinct from Earth's? Right. Would they see themselves as Martians first and humans second? It's like we'd be seeding a new branch of humanity one that would evolve and adapt to a completely different environment. Right. It's both exciting and a bit unsettling to think about. It is, isn't it? And it brings us back to those profound philosophical questions we touched on earlier. Right. What does it mean to be human? What are our responsibilities to future generations, both on Earth and potentially on other worlds? These are questions that will likely continue to be debated for centuries to come. Wow, this deep dive has really opened my eyes to the complexity of this issue. Yeah. It's so much more than just a scientific or technological challenge. It really is. It's a cultural, philosophical, and even existential journey. I couldn't have said it better myself. The quest to colonize Mars is a reflection of who we are as a species. Our dreams, our fears, our aspirations, and our limitations. Yeah, it's I mean, a journey of self-discovery on a cosmic scale. Okay, after all this, I'm even more curious about what the future holds Will we see humans walking on Mars in our lifetime? Yeah. Will we witness the birth of the first Martian generation? Only time will tell. But one thing's for sure, this is a story that's just beginning. It's a story that we all have a part in shaping, whether we're scientists, engineers, philosophers, or simply curious individuals who look up at the night sky and wonder about what's out there. So to all of you listening, we want to hear from you. Yeah. What are your thoughts on Mars colonization? Does it excite you, scare you, or both? Share your thoughts in the comments below, and let's keep this conversation going. And if you found this deep dive thought-provoking, please hit that like button and subscribe to our channel for more fascinating explorations of the big questions facing humanity. Thanks for joining us on this incredible journey. Until next time, keep exploring the universe and all its wonders.